Hi, my name is Phil Cameron. I am the chef at the German Embassy and today we're going to make a Christmas meal my way. Alright, the first thing you're going to want to do is rough chop your onions. So I'm just slicing kind of in six. My celery, just cutting up like that. I have my leeks over here. Again, just really a rough chop. Um, everything here is going to get blended at the end of the soup. So don't stress too much um, the cutting of it all. I'm going to come over here and peel my apple. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a pot, put my butter in, and I'm going to start sweating all these ingredients. The apple, we're going to chop it up again, rough chop, just like that. So now that we've got all that, we're going to go to the other side, to my uh, kitchen set, and we're going to sweat all this off. Alright, so we're going to turn our burner on to uh, medium high. And what we're going to do is we're going to let the pan warm up and we're going to throw the butter in. We're going to let the butter slowly melt and once it's melted we'll throw in all our ingredients uh, include, including the garlic that I did not chop up and we will let all that sweat. What I mean by when I say sweating is that I want my onions, my, my garlic, my my shallots, or sorry, not my shallots, but my, my leeks um, and my celery to become translucent. So I don't want any coloration on it. I don't want uh, that rich sweetness that we get when we caramelize something. I just want to extract as much water as we can. So this is a special soup to me uh, because when I was younger, we ate a lot of cream soups, uh, squash soups, uh, celery, celery yak soups, and of course uh, the traditional uh, French onion soups closer to Christmas. But this is one that really stuck with me through the years. Um, I really worked the recipe and um, I wanted to share it with you. So now the butter is nice and melted. We're gonna throw in all these wonderful ingredients here. I have my whole garlic. And again, um, I didn't chop it up because at the end, uh, once everything is cooked down, we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have to put into a blender and the blender will take care of, of uh, making it nice and smooth. So I'm just going to let it sweat for a few minutes. I'm going to stir it around once in a while. And once most of this is nice and translucent, I will add the, the apples. For now, we're going to go back to the other side of the kitchen and we're going to continue the preparation. All right, now we'll take our celery yak which is also known as a celery root. I've already taken uh, the skin off. Uh, to save a bit of time and we're just going to again rough chop it um, it doesn't have to be very exact it's it's just going to go into the soup and get blended so there's no stress um, just something like this is good sometimes you'll fall onto something like this that is fine because there's no uh, brown uh, but it's, it is normal in the celery roots to find this so don't um, don't be surprised if you cut it open and you find a cavity like that. You just want to cut it out if it has brown or black pieces. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. So there you go. Now that we have the celery yak, we have our nice piece of thyme that we'll also use uh, whole. And we're going to take it out just at the end uh, before blending it. And we have our cream and our uh, chicken broth here. Now, if you don't like chicken broth, you can substitute it with uh, vegetable stock. You can substitute it um, with a beef stock. Mind you, if you use a beef stock, it will change the color. 
so just keep that in mind um, when you decide to use um, a bra. So there you go. So you see a bit of coloration. Uh, we want to try to avoid that. Um, but you're starting to see the sweating of these beautiful ingredients. And we're almost at the point that we'd want to stop cooking them. So I'm going to throw in the apples just like that and uh, go into celery yak. And essentially all we're doing now is just making sure to try to get as much as much of the water out so we can keep the flavor in and when we take the water out it really takes it really enhances that flavor profile so I'll give that another about two minutes and again just just keep stirring it um, if you have a bit of coloration it's not the end of the world but you don't want to have too much because that will really change the, the taste and the color of the soup So right now in the pot we have 20 grams of butter, 75 grams of leeks, 50 grams of onion, 25 grams of celery, 5 grams of garlic, and 200 grams of celery yak. Now if you take a look, you can see that the onion has changed colors, the, the leeks have changed colors, um, that's what I mean by sweating. So what we'll do now is we're going to add our chicken broth. We're going to add our thyme. And we're going to add our maple syrup. Now, why I use maple syrup? Um, of course, I have the French, the French in me. Um, so a lot of my recipes, I substitute the sugar with maple syrup. Um, but also the celery yak has a bit of a bitter taste. So the maple syrup is going to help balance out that, that bitterness. It's going to come add just a bit of sweetness, not too much, but just enough to uh, counterbalance that, uh, that bitterness that we find in the celery yak. So now that we have all our ingredients in, uh, we don't want it to be boiling that hard. We're going to turn it down to a medium low heat and we just want a, a nice simmer. And we just want some of some of evaporation, the, the stock, the juices are going to incorporate into uh, all these vegetables and soon we'll have a nice consistency. I'll show you that after. All right, so now that our soup is going, uh, that is something that takes some time. We're going to jump in to the uh, croutons. So we're going to cut, again, very rough chop. Um, don't stress the cutting too much right now. I'll tell you when you do have to focus. But we just want small little pieces like this. A um, bit like that. This is the size we're looking for for the, the, the croutons. Um, next, we'll take our garlic, and this time we're going to mince our garlic. So very small chop, and just be careful with the blade. I use a very sharp knife because I find my tools are the most important thing I have at my availability. If I don't have a sharp knife, I can't do the job. It's just like someone building a house. If they don't have the right hammer, they won't build a nice house. So once again, I want a very small chop. Right, let's uh, pause for a second. Now that we have our garlic, we're gonna come over here and just pull off the, the thyme. And we're gonna chop that finely once again.
All right. So there you go. Now we have the preparation ready. We're gonna go back over to the stove top and we're gonna, all right. So now we're gonna crisp up the croutons. So we're gonna turn the pan on at a medium heat. Once again, throw the butter in and just let the butter melt. So I have about 20 grams of butter that is now melted in my pan. And I'm gonna go ahead and push in the garlic and cook it just a bit, just a bit. I don't wanna cook it too much, but I, I wanna make sure that I get these nice aromas, these nice oils out of the garlic. Um, so as you can see, it, it cooks pretty fast. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw in the croutons and they're gonna slowly start browning. Now, for me, this is a very important recipe. Uh, you can do it in the oven, you can do it in a pan, uh, but you can use this for a Caesar salad, you can use this for soups, you can use this for other garnishes. It's a very um, flexible recipe and you just want that butter to soak into these croutons. Now, once you have that done, you want to just let them be and let them roast a bit. We won't put the time in right now just because uh, the time uh, might burn. So we're just going to let it be. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw in a pinch of pepper and a pinch of salt. So you can kind of smell the bread starting to toast, as you can see right here. And that's, that's the browning we're looking for. Some people prefer it in the oven. It is a more of an even cook, but I like it in the pan. It gives nice results. So there you go. We're gonna leave it in the pan. The heat will continue to heat heat them. Now we're gonna move right into the caramelized walnuts. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw the maple syrup into a different pan. And we're also gonna throw the walnuts right into that pan and we're going to want to mix it up. So right now the maple syrup is still at the bottom of the pan, but what's going to happen as time progresses is that that maple syrup will soak into the walnuts and will slowly become more syrupy and eventually become a solid sugar that will coat the exterior of your walnuts. So already you can see a lot of the maple syrup is already on our walnuts. These are two very simple recipes uh, to enhance any dish you want. Acts really well as a garnish or simply as a snack or on a cheese board. Uh, it's, it's a delicious recipe. And I'm going to also throw a bit of salt on top of them. Always season everything you do. And now you can see that that nice maple syrup is gone. The oils are coming out. You can smell the, the walnuts. It's just, it smells like Christmas. Walnuts do burn fast, so you want to keep kind of moving them around. And the maple syrup does burn fast too. So if I look here, we have a nice coating on the walnuts. Uh, be careful, it is very hot. Uh, sugar can burn you very easily. And we're just gonna take that off the stove. Now that the croutons have crisped up, you can hear it like that. We're just gonna throw in the thyme and just toss it. And make 
sure that the croutons soak, soak in a bit of that oil, just like that. So there you go, now your croutons are officially done. All right, so next, this is optional, you don't need to do this, but this is just a small garnish that I do. So I have a bit of water in this cup and I have about 20 grams of sour cream here. I'm gonna add a bit of water to thin out the sour cream. Give it a nice mixture. And we just want it a bit thinner than that. So I'm gonna keep adding a bit of water until I have the desired consistency. Like I said, this is just going to be to garnish the soup, so there you go, you have a nice thin mixture, pinch of salt, there you go, I'll show you how to plate everything at the end. So now our soup has been on the stove for about 25-30 minutes, I'm going to take the time out. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn off the elements and we're going to come and scoop all this goodness into my blender. And you'll reach a point where there's juice at the bottom. So we're just going to come over here, come and scrape everything out. We don't want to waste anything. That's very important to a chef. go. Now we're going to throw in the cream. We're going to come back over here with our blender, put the lid on and make sure that you start the blender off at low because you don't want it splashing up and then you have bits stuck up there. It's a mess. So here we go. And gradually just bring the mix, bring it up, and just keep turning it up. this nice thick and rich soup but one thing we didn't do and here's where I tell everyone I don't I don't season my soup until I'm ready to serve it or just before serving it because if I make this the day before um, and I do recommend to make it the day before so you have more time to focus on other things um, I don't season it because I'm gonna put it back into a pot it'll keep reducing and when you lose the water this, the, the saltiness will be a bit more present, so I do not put the salt until I'm ready to, just about ready to serve it. Right now though, we're about to, we're, we can serve it very soon. So I'm gonna put a bit of pepper. And I don't measure salt and pepper because I feel like it's a, it's a taste thing. So I'm gonna put a bit of salt. I'm gonna turn my blender back on or if you have it in a pot and you're warming it back up the next day, then you can do it in that pot. But for this example, I'm just gonna show you this way. And I'm gonna try it. Very important to try it and then adjust the seasoning once again. So, very good beautiful taste. I just think it needs a bit more salt. And then I'm going to mix it one more time and it'll be ready to serve. I'm going to put it back into a pot and just put a lid on it and make sure that it stays warm. There you have it. 
All right, the next recipe that we're going to work on is the peppermint mousse. So what we're going to do first is we're going to take our chocolate and we're going to chop it nice and rough. Just like that. Turn it around again, just so we have a nice grainy mixture. So we're going to turn around and we're going to go to the stove. I'm just going to push the chocolate back into my container. And now we're back to the stove. We're going to turn it on to medium. And as you can see, I have a bit of water. So what this is called is called a double, uh, double boiler. And the water will evaporate onto the bottom of the bowl and will heat up the chocolate. Now, why we do this is because chocolate's worst enemy is water. The minute water incorpor incorporates with the chocolate, uh, it changes colors, it, the, cha the, the taste changes. Um, so we wanna try to keep the water out. So I'm just gonna put the chocolate in here and I'm just gonna spread it out and I'm gonna let it melt. Um, once in a while, you're gonna want to mix it with a spatula, but for now, we're just gonna let it. All right, so we're gonna have our cream uh, you can, if you have a stand mixer, you can use the stand mixer. Go ahead and put the cream into the stand mixer. If you don't have a stand mixer, you can use a hand mixer. You can use uh, just a nice, nice simple whisk. Um, I'm lazy, so I try to find the fastest way to get to the objective. So I'm going to use the stand mixer. So here we go. I'm going to turn it on at the highest speed, and we're going to let it mix and fluff up. While, while that is whip, whipping, I'm going to use my spoon and just break the candy cane. Once the whipping cream is almost completely whipped, we're going to take our peppermint extract and we're just going to throw that in so it can whip, whip up with the mixture. Alright, so now back to the chocolate, you can see it start to melt and we're just going to come and give it a nice stir. There's still chunks, so we're going to keep stirring it until there's no more chunks in your chocolate. Make sure to scrape the sides and you'll see soon you'll have a nice smooth consistency. There you go. Turn off the heat. Right, so now we have this nice whipped cream over here. We're gonna come into our chocolate and we're gonna pour, we're gonna just mix the chocolate to kind of get it to a lower temperature. Right now it's, if we poured it right into the cream, the cream would kind of lose its fluffiness and that's what we want to avoid. So I'm just gonna whip it around a bit. And then I'm gonna take half the chocolate, pour it in, and we don't wanna mix, we wanna fold. So folding means that I'm gonna come and just exactly as it says, fold it. Just like that. You can see how the mixture is starting to shape up. I'm going to come and get the rest of the chocolate into the mixture. Just like that. So many recipes um, actually use eggs in a mousse. 
Um, I'm showing you the easier recipe. Um, this is something that you can wow your guests uh, with very minimal effort. Um, so if you want to recreate this during the holiday season and have fun with your kids or simply have a nice dessert ready to go, this is something you can do the day before and just throw it in the fridge. And there you go. So now you have a nice and even consistency. It still has this fluffiness. It still holds. It's, it's beautiful. All right, so now we switch back to my prepping area. We have our mousse. And what I do, what I like doing, and this is a, a tip that I have for you is when you're piping something, I use a cylinder cup and I just put my piping bag like that so that I have an easier chance to scrape the bowl and get all that nice mousse into my piping bag. So, just a tip, um, you can do it by hand, that's fine, but it just avoids the air pockets later on when you're piping it. So, there you go. When I use a piping bag, um, I have a star tip right there, and I just twist like that until I see that the mixture is at the end. I have this really nice cup here and what I'm gonna do this is for two portions so keep in mind I'm just gonna come and do something like that and the candy cane that we have is just to add a bit of texture and there you have it a nice and simple dish that will wow your your, your guests not complicated very time uh, not very time consuming uh, this is one of the first recipes that I learned in school. It's actually one of the, the exams I had. Um, and I'll never forget this recipe. It's uh, always in my head and uh, it's dear to me. So please enjoy. All right, so now we're going to work on the main. So what we're making for a main, uh, one of the elements is a stuffing. So we're going to take our bread and you notice that I've already melted some butter. I've whipped up half an egg. And just like the croutons, I'm just gonna come and rough chop my piece of bread, just like that. So from there, I'm just gonna put the egg into the butter. And actually, we're gonna take a bit of butter and just grease the inside of your bowl. That will help us later on. And we're going to put that aside, kind of mix the butter and the egg like that. Now, we're going to make a brunoise of vegetables. So I'm just going to cut a nice even surface for the carrot so it doesn't wobble. And I'll show you how to make a brunoise. It's a very small chop. So we're gonna make a uh, batonnet, which is all French terms, um, but they are used in restaurants across the world. So there you have a small brunoise. We're gonna do that with the entirety of the vegetables. And if you can't get it this small, don't, don't stress it. Uh, this is just, you know, a perfectionist side of a chef. Uh, it kind of looks good as a preparation and also the carrots will cook a bit e more even uh, if you get the chops correctly. But I said this is for fun. Uh, if you're doing it with your kids just have fun. Uh, there's no stress. This is not a competition. Uh, you don't have to rush. I recommend to do the stuffing ahead of time so the day before and then all you can do is um, warm it up the next day. And the stuffing is really good cold too. Now we'll do the onion. Now it's a very small piece of onion. I'm just gonna cut the middle like that and cut very small little 
pieces and once again chop it up into my Livernoise. And if you have any pieces like this that are left, you can just rough chop them um, into a smaller cut, just like that. So I have my onion, I have my carrots, and now I have my celery. The celery, such a small amount. Again, don't don't stress too much the size. Um, this will not be considered a brunoise, but the chop um, is still small enough. So here we go. I'm just gonna rough chop it just to get it kind of to the same size as everything else. There you go. So now you have your onion, you have your carrots, and you have your celery. I'm gonna come and chop my garlic. I really personally like garlic a lot. Um, some of you might not. Um, so feel free to cut the amount in half. I just like the taste of garlic. Um, it's probably from the French side of my family. And I'm just gonna come and mince the garlic. Again, being careful when I take the garlic off the blade. It's so weird to be cutting a small quantity. I'm so used to cutting large quantities uh, when I'm working at work or volunteering or what it might be. Um, I'm peeling and chopping industrial amounts of garlic and, and onions and carrots. It uh, has helped me increase my speed. So don't feel the need to go as fast as me. Now I have my parsley, my flat leaf parsley, and we'll hold it like this. And we're gonna cut it like a chiffonade, almost. And if you're scared of holding it too close, you can also just chop it, um, like freelancing it, like this. But essentially you want a fine chop of your flat leaf parsley. And again, come and take that parsley off. And there you go, you have your parsley done now. Finally, you have your thyme. And as I showed before, we're just gonna come and get thyme off the stem. Just like that. And we're gonna chop it like we did the, the parsley. Stuffing is a very important thing to me personally because when I was younger it'd always be in the stuffed turkey at Thanksgiving or the turkey at Christmas time. Um, we would actually cook it inside the turkey so it would get uh, some of those turkey juices and it would soak it all up. Um, it was very good. This is just a different way of doing it. So now that we have all that ch chopped up, we're going to take our mixture and we're just going to throw everything in. Just like that. You can get it off your hands, off the sides, mix it up. And then lastly, we'll throw the bread in. And what the bread will do is soak in all that butter and egg and just become very savory because of all the different ingredients that we're now incorporating into the recipe. And of course, we can't forget our salt and our pepper. So a bit of pepper, not too much, and a bit of salt. Once again, mix it up. And we're gonna go back to that mold that we had earlier that we buttered a bit. And the butter is so that the parchment paper st sticks down and stays down. So I'm gonna push it down just like that. So you have your mold. And then I'm gonna come and 
empty the mixture and kind of push it down, not too much, but you want the stuffing to take the shape of your mold. There you go. All right, now that we have our stuffing, we're gonna throw it into the oven at 375 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's gonna cook for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then once you take it out, you can either put it aside, let it cool off and reheat it the next day, or simply leave it aside. It is good at room temperature. It is good at a lukewarm temperature. So don't stress the stuffing too much. All right, now that we've gone uh, the prep from yesterday done. We're going to jump into the main dishes today and we're really going to dive into it. This is the fresher uh, and the main course uh, that I'm going to be presenting. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to peel our potatoes. If you peel the potatoes the day before, it's an option. Just make sure that however you store them, you store them in the fridge but submerge them in water because potatoes oxidize very fast and will turn brown, gray, uh, reddish. It's a very strange color. Um, and once that happens, um, the taste changes a bit and the visual aspect changes a bit. So again, I have a pot full of water here. Uh, I use cold water. Um, the reason why I use cold water is because uh, when you're cooking the potato, if you have it in hot water, um, like blanching uh, a vegetable, uh, blanching gets the outside um, to be cooked very fast and the inside's a bit crunchy still. All, we don't want to do that with a potato. So what we do is we have room temperature or cold water and slowly we bring it up so that the potato can gradually gain temperature and cook evenly. So that's a bit of the science in behind cooking a potato I'm just about done here and what we're gonna do next is we're gonna cut the potatoes in quarters because again if we put the potatoes in full it'll just take too long to cook and we don't want that so I'm gonna take my chef knife cut it and we're just gonna get nice half potatoes and quarter them and I'm gonna get these out do the same thing. Once more. And then again, like I said, we're going to throw all the potatoes in the cold water that I have. And we're going to put it over medium heat. And we're going to put it to medium medium high heat and we're going to let that cook for about 20-25 minutes until I can poke a knife or a fork through the flesh. So now that our potatoes are on the stove, they're starting to cook, we're going to make the cranberry sauce very important. Uh, we're going to take our garlic and we're just going to have a nice dice or a nice uh, mince going. I like to use a lot of garlic, some pe uh, sorry, a lot of ginger. Some people don't like the taste of ginger. If you're one of those people, cut the amount by half. Uh, it will still taste fantastic, um, but I just like the intense flavor. Uh, you'll see it'll go very well um, with the duck, uh, but if you eat it on its own, it'll be very tart, it'll be very sour, um, and don't be alarmed by that. Um, it's just the way it's supposed to be. The fat kind of uh, evens out and balances out the dish. Um, you'll see that later once you eat everything together. And don't worry about how fine you get the ginger because once again we're blending this and we're going to pass it through a strainer so don't worry about it too much. So now I have all my ingredients ready. We're gonna go over to the stove and we're gonna get that cooking. Fruit juice, uh, if you have fresh oranges, you can use fresh oranges. If you have orange juice, you can simply use the orange juice. We're gonna throw in our ginger, our cranberries, and finally our sugar.
mix it all up. I like to throw a, bit, a pinch of sh uh, salt in there. And again, we're just going to let it cook down. And once some of the orange juice and the juices have, is evaporated, you're going to see the cranberries are going to start to pop, are going to start to split. Uh, that's when we're going to take it out and blend it. But for now, let's keep going on the rest of our mise en place. All right, now the stuffing is ready. It's been 15, between 15 and 20 minutes. Uh, it just depends how thick you have it. So right here, you push down and it's nice and springy. I'm just gonna let that to the side. If you wanna keep it in a warm place on your stove top, that's fine. We're gonna cut it up later. All right, so now that we have our cranberry sauce on the go, we have our potatoes starting to cook. Uh, now we're gonna make the mise en place uh, for the duck and the Brussels sprouts. And when I say mise en place, uh, mise en place is a French term meaning prep. Uh, so your prep work, your preparation. Prep work is very important in the kitchen. If you have your prep work done correctly, then it's, it's very easy to finish everything in the end. So either use a, a paring knife or your chef's knife. We're just gonna come over here, take the outside layer of these Brussels sprouts and cut them in a half like this. So I have about 10 Brussels sprouts, I would say. And we want to put the Brussels sprouts facing down when we're frying them, because they'll get this beautiful color. Uh, the inside will start cooking, and then we'll flip them just at the end, just to get a bit of coloration on the outside. But essentially, that's what we're doing. And there's many kids that don't love Brussels sprouts. Um, I was the opposite as a kid. I love Brussels sprouts. Um, I practically begged my parents to have Brussels sprouts. Um, I didn't find out how to cook Brussels sprouts my favorite way until much later in my life because my parents just did boiled Brussels sprouts. But um, it's such a versatile ingredient. Uh, you can replace, um, let's say, romaine lettuce with Brussels sprouts and make a Brussels sprout a Caesar salad or um, you can fry them. Um, I've seen chefs use uh, tahini uh, sauce and fry them and then lather them in tahini sauce or simply just roast them in the oven uh, with a bit of olive and olive oil and uh, salt and pepper. It just comes out just so exquisite. Um, again, one of my favorite ingredients in the kitchen. So there you have it. Um, I've cut up all the Brussels sprouts, so we'll put that on the side. And now we're gonna work on the duck. So um, I'm gonna change boards because I'm gonna be cutting meat. So I'm just gonna switch over this board right here. And um, I got this duck and it's from a wonderful company called King Cole Duck. And essentially there's this little piece here. We're just gonna to wanna to take it off uh, it's not bad. I usually just cook it on its own and um, have a little snack before the duck is ready. And I'm just going to clean up the duck a bit. The skin that you see here is called silver skin. It's a tougher um, skin and when you cook it, it becomes very chewy. So we just want to come and clean that off. Um, take your time. Don't, don't rush. Um, and it's essentially just so it's easier to eat later on. So that's, that's the silver skin part. And now we have too much fat. Um, and fat is good, uh, but too much can be a hassle. So what I do is I just run my knife along and I kind of just cut around. And I'm doing this fast because I've had a lot of practice um, but when you're at home, take your time. Now you can see a beautiful, just small layer of fat. And uh, I keep the fat, I render the fat to uh, use it later on. You could cook your Brussels sprouts, for example, with them. Um, and I'm gonna come and score my beautiful King Cole duck breast. So just nice and lightly run your knife across the fat and 
there you go, you've just scored your duck breast. All right, so now, as you can see, um, my juices have almost caramelized, have become a syrup consistency. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pour it into my small blender this time uh, because the quantity is so small I can't use the big blender. And I mean, you don't need to put it through the blender, this is optional. Um, I do recommend because of the consistency uh, you'll see later it's it's like a it's a, it's a spread so we're just gonna get that top on and we're just gonna let it blitz all right so now that I've blitzed my cranberry just wash out when you open it up uh, this very thick mixture and uh, cranberries have seeds in them so I'm just gonna make sure that um, on my plating I don't have any seeds uh, the the texture will be very smooth so I'm gonna put it through my, my sieve or my fine mesh strainer whatever you have and again this is this is optional you don't need to do this don't feel like you do if you want the cranberries to be whole um, you can serve them whole like that as well And I'm just gonna slowly push my cranberry through it. And I'll make sure to just clean my spatula. And come and scrape the nice coolie that we have or puree that we have into the bowl so we're not wasting anything we have a very very thick consistency that's exactly what we're looking for um, we're gonna put a cover on that and we're gonna leave it for plating a bit later all right so now our potatoes are almost done I have my cream the butter the goat cheese and the confit garlic. I'm gonna want to warm these up, so I'm gonna use a spatula pour it into my small pan, and I'm gonna turn it to about a medium heat. Now, one thing about cream uh, milk, uh, once it gets very hot, it's, it might boil over. So just keep an eye out on it. Uh, stir it once in a while with your your spatula, and just make sure that it just gets all melted up in your pan. So now I'm going to take my potatoes, I'm going to use a strainer, I'm just going to strain it in my kitchen sink and I'm going to keep the same pot, I'm going to put it over here, turn off the, the stove top and I'm just going to shake the potatoes a bit, make sure that the potatoes are nice and strained and I'm going to come over here and on top of the same uh, pot I'm going to push the potatoes through the strainer now if you have a ricer use the ricer um, some people use a, a stand mixer or a hand mixer um, this is the way I'm going to show you guys because I want to make sure that you guys understand that um, you can do this simple so again I'm just going to push all the potatoes through the small holes of the strainer. This is not the smoothest way of doing it, but again, I want to make sure that you at home realize that this is possible for everyone uh, making nice creamy potatoes. Um, I personally used Yukon Golds for this recipe, um, but Rosette potatoes work as well. Um, I find the Yukon Golds have a, a sweeter flavor um, and the resets have a bit more starch. So I'm just using the Yukon Golds, but go ahead and use uh, your favorite potatoes. There you go, so they're all passed through the 
the strainer. I'm just going to nicely, gently scrape the excess that is still hanging on to that into the pot. Now our cream, butter, and goat cheese has had the chance to melt. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pour that nice creamy mixture into the potatoes. Don't forget to turn off the stove top and essentially I'm just going to come around, mix it all up, make sure that I get the edges and you can smell the garlic, you can smell the richness of the butter, the, the cream and the goat cheese and I'm going to throw a bit of salt in there, of course a bit of pepper and once again mix it up and finally I'm going to taste it. All right, in my opinion it needs a bit more salt so I'm going to season again. And now you have this nice thick consistency. It's, it's beautiful, smells good. Again, it smells just like Christmas. Um, it reminds me of my childhood. So I'm going to put a cover on that and just let it sit until we're ready. Now, the moment you are waiting for, my beautiful King Cold Duck breast. Um, we're going to season it, of course. So a bit of pepper, and I want to put a lot of salt onto the duck skin or the duck fat because that fat we're going to render it. Now I'm going to use my one hand to flip it over and I'm going to season the other side. A bit of pepper. And a lot of people will put the duck breast on a hot pan. Um, I encourage you to try it this way. My pan is cold right now. I just slapped the duck breast on top of the cold pan. So, I have my, my cold duck breast on the pan. I have the skin side down and I'm going to turn it to about a medium, medium high heat. And what that's going to allow it to do is that the fat, you saw the heavy layer that we had, it will render. And what rendering means is that the fat will slowly come out and it will leave a crunchy, crispy um, duck skin. And that's exactly what we're looking for when we're cooking duck. So again, this will take a bit of time. We're going to jump right into uh, the Brussels sprouts. Uh, you can wait a bit on the Brussels sprouts. Uh, for the purpose of this demonstration, I'll make them right now. Um, so we're going to dump our oil in to this pan here. We're going to turn it to a medium heat and we're going to allow the oil to warm up. All right, so now the Brussels sprouts. So my oil is hot and I put all my Brussels sprouts face down. Again, a lot of people get scared of hot oil. It is to be care you have to be careful with it because it can splatter, but don't be too scared of it. Some people throw the food into the pan. Just go and lightly drop it. In, um, don't be scared. Uh, when you're scared, you, you splash the oil up a bit more. And you want to put it down away from you. So just like that, there you go, no problem. Um, no splashing, no nothing. Um, just nice and safe. So these are going to start frying. And now you can hear the crackling of the duck. So as you can see around the duck, there's some fat and that's what I mean by rendering the fat. So right now the fat is a bit thick, but you're going to see in a few minutes when I turn it around, it'll be nice and gold and crispy. It'll be very appetizing um, and that's exactly what we will try to duplicate back at home. So stay tuned for the Brussels sprouts, stay tuned for the duck. All right, so it's been about, I'd say a minute and a half to two minutes. You can see this nice golden texture on our Brussels. So we're gonna flip them over. Uh, you might wanna turn down the heat just a bit because the oil might start splashing. 
Just be careful. Uh, if the oil does start splashing, just take it off the heat. Uh, the worst thing to do is to start panicking because then you lose control of what's going on. But you just flip it and what you see it's nice and golden. Uh, you have them crispy. That's exactly what we're looking for. And there you go. So I personally like my Brussels sprouts crunchy. Uh, I'd say take them off the heat um, and let them continue to cook in the oil. And if you like them soft, just keep cooking them at a low temperature. They're gonna like, kinda like poach. Now we're gonna take a look at our duck breast. And you can see the nice, beautiful, golden uh, texture that we have. I'm just gonna leave it a bit longer because I want some of that fat to, to render some more. So again, I turned down the heat a bit. Um, we're about at a medium low temperature. And you can see in the pan, uh, all that fat that has rendered out, that's, that's exactly what we're looking for uh, when we're cooking duck. So now that we've had these Brussels sprouts in the oil, you can see that now the other side has crisped up a bit too. I'm gonna take my Brussels sprouts and simply put them on a cloth to let the oil soak out. And I'm gonna turn the oven off and I'm gonna let it open for a bit and I'm gonna throw the Brussels sprouts in so they stay nice and crispy and warm. Now, you can see a beautiful color. You can't re really hear it, but it is crispy and it's nice. I just turned it over. Now that that's done, I'm gonna throw in my garlic and my thyme. And what that's gonna do is that the duck breast is gonna take some of those beautiful flavors. And that's gonna cook. Now some chefs will use their fingers to kind of feel the firmness of the meat. Um, if you don't feel com comfortable doing that, that's okay. Uh, you can simply use a thermometer. So I have my thermometer here. We're gonna probe it in a, in a few seconds. Um, but what I like to do with the duck is you see how it's caramelizing underneath. We're gonna leave it a bit more, but I'm also gonna caramelize the sides because you go and get that caramelization, it's just extra flavor all around. So just use your tongs, come and caramelize the outside. Let it cook a bit more. Flip the garlic around, flip the thyme around, uh, let the nice oils from the duck infuse with them. So what's important with meat is that you let your meat rest uh, after you've cooked it. Um, after you take it off, the juices still keep uh, cooking and the temperature actually goes up a few degrees. So it's very important to remember that um, when you're cooking the duck. So I'm going to probe my duck for the first time. And I'm currently at exactly 135. That is a perfect temperature, in my opinion, that's a medium rare. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna take a plate. I'm gonna take my duck and I'm gonna let it rest for about five to 10 minutes. And that will allow the juices to soak into uh, the, the fiber that we have in the meat. And um, if, you if you cut the meat too quick, you lose too much juice, the, 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 the blood comes pouring out, you really, really need to let your meat rest because the juices will get almost absorbed back into the tissue. So do yourself a favor, let it rest five, 10 minutes. It will not affect your duck whatsoever. All right, so now that the Brussels sprouts are on the Scott towel, we're just gonna sprinkle a bit of salt and just move them around just like that just for a bit of seasoning. All right, so we have everything ready. 
um, every component is here. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to take our potatoes and we're going to come and make a nice generous portion and we're going to hit the middle just like that. Um, if you want to make a canal, go ahead. I'm just kind of making a bed for uh, the later steps. I'm going to come and take my, my farce and I cut the edges off, kind of just squaring it off. And I'm going to cut a nice square piece and put it right there, just like that. You can come and take a few Brussels sprouts and just lay them into the potatoes. The beautiful, crunchy Brussels sprouts. And I take my cranberry sauce and I'm going to just lay a bit like that and you can push it like that, just like that, nice and smooth, just like that. So a nice push. So in case you can't see it, just like that. And finally, I'm going to go over to my duck. Now my duck has been resting for about, I'd say five, seven minutes. And I'm just going to cut the duck and look at that. Beautiful, beautiful color. Um, I like to cut my duck thin. I remember that once you cut the duck, uh, it's going to start becoming gray on the outside. So make sure that you're ready to serve it right away. Now I take the, the end pieces off and I'm just going to go ahead and fan it out a bit like that and uh, just put it on top of my potatoes and there we go. nice beautiful presentation just in time for the holidays while wow your guests while wow your family while wow your loved ones just smells like Christmas in here it's it's beautiful Alright, now we're going to go into plating the soup. So, I warmed up my soup. I'm going to take a ladle and nicely just pour a bit of this creamy, lovely smelling soup into the bowl. And I'm just going to shake it out and make it nice and even. I'm going to take the sour cream. I'm just going to a few drops here and there doesn't have to be exact, just a bit of abstract. I'm going to take a few caramelized nuts. Again, this is a very abstract finishing plating, just like that. A few croutons in, just like that. And just to add a bit of color, I'm going to go and add some parsley. There we go, very simple plating of a cel celery act soup. So I hope everyone's enjoyed this beautiful supper uh, as much as I did as a child. Um, I hope that you've also enjoyed it with your loved ones. Go back and create your own version of this dish and share it with uh, your friends and family uh, for the holiday. And best of all, thank you for helping us raise money for the people that need it the most.